Dear colleagues, students, guests, I would like to welcome you to the second lecture in this lecture series that the Faculty of Arts and Sciences has organized to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Robert College and Boazici University. Let me start with a few words about this history. The idea of Robert College began on the suggestion of two brothers. We have a problem. Okay, the idea of Robert College began on the suggestion of two brothers, James and William Dwight, sons of Dr. Otis Dwight, a pioneer researcher of the Near East for American missionary effort. Their intention was to establish a secular institution of higher learning in Istanbul, entirely separate from the American missionary colony in the Ottoman Empire. A noted New York merchant and philanthropist of Christian causes, Christopher Rhinelander Robert, agreed to supply the funds and the mission of establishing the institution was given to Cyrus Hamlin, the director of Bebek Seminary, a man with long experience in the missionary education in the Ottoman Empire, but with his own practical and pragmatic approach to education. So the idea came from the Dwight brothers, the money from Robert, and the energy and the oversight and the actual implementation from Hamlin. And what emerged was definitely not a missionary school and not a secular school, but a school with liberal New England educational lines led by individuals with strong Christian values. And the college opened its doors in 1863 to Bulgarian, Armenian, Greek, and other minorities living in the Ottoman Empire. The integration of the college into the Turkish educational scene possibly begins with the graduation of the first Turkish student, Hussein Pektaş, in 1903. That year, there were 320 students from 14 different ethnic and religious backgrounds and of this number, only six were Turks. During the next 30 years, the enrollment went up to 750, and the proportion of Turks rose to more than 50%. A major contribution to the integration came from the establishment of the engineering school in 1912. By the early 50, 1950s, the college had established its prestige in Turkey and with the increasing demand, two new faculties, the School of Sciences and Languages, which became the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and the School of Business Administration and Economics were added in 1959. Established in a tumultuous time and at the center of the world as the college song began, the college survived two world wars, a Great Depression, and saw the fall of an empire and the foundation of a new republic, throughout which it never once closed its doors for a single day. When it celebrated its 100th anniversary in 1963, the college had reached its widest state of extension with a woman's college on the Arnautke campus, a man's high school and university on the Bebek campus. However, for all its continued growth and success, the history of Robert College had been haunted with one major recurring theme, the shortage of funds. And in 1970, when it was financially impossible to keep the present structure, the Board of Trustees decided to keep a co-ed high school on the Arnutke campus and to hand this campus 
and the mission of university education to the Turkish state. So was born Boğaziçi University in 1971. Since then, Boğaziçi University has grown to be a much larger institution with more than 13,000 students, about 500 faculty members, and a large graduate school, and in its 42 years, established a reputation of its own as the leading university in Turkey. But it has never broken its ties with its past, the heritage of Robert College. And the fact that it grew out of Robert College continues to leave its mark to inspire its direction and to guide its development into the future. I hope this lecture series, in the variety of its offerings and excellence of its content, will be seen as fitting contribution to the continuation of this tradition. I now invite Professor Alpar Sevgen to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much. We are very happy to have Professor Flipenko uh, from uh, Berkeley to give us this uh, lecture about this exciting uh, topic. He, I want to uh, make it very short. He is an elected member of the United States National Academy of Sciences and is one of the world's most highly cited astronomers. He is the recipient of num numerous prizes for his scientific research and was the only person to have been a member of both teams that revealed the accelerating expansion of the universe. Perhaps you may comment on it, on it to be a member on both teams. Okay, and uh, winner of prestigious teaching awards at Berkeley and voted the best professor on campus a record nine times. And he was named National Professor of the Year in 2006. He has produced five astronomy video courses, one of which, which is 96 in number, uh, each half an hour long. We showed it all throughout one academic year in a very stubborn way. Uh, we showed all 96 of them uh, in this uh, campus. And uh, he co-authored an award-winning astronomy textbook, which we are using in our Exploring the Universe uh, course, and uh, has appeared in about 100 TV documentaries. I think you are adding to that now in Turkey, to that 100. Uh, and in 2004, he was awarded the Carl Sagan Prize for the popularization of uh, science. It's an honor to have Professor Flipenko with us. Please. Well, thank you very, very much for that very kind introduction. It is such a great, great pleasure for me to be here to help honor the 150th year of Boazici University. And look at the amazing interest in this lecture series. My goodness, you're going to have to find a bigger room for the other lecturers, I think, right? <laughs> anyway, it's, it's wonderful that there's such a great diversity of, uh, of excellent speakers celebrating your wonderful achievement here, 150 years. My own university, Berkeley, is today 145 years old, so we are five years younger than Boazici. So. Uh, as Alpar mentioned, I'll be discussing today the work that was honored with the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. The Nobel Prize, other than the Peace Prize, which can be given to organizations such as the Red Cross, the Nobel Prize in general is only offered to up to three individuals, usually the leaders of the team or the teams that made the discovery. So although there were 51 people involved in the two papers that were published in 1998 on this discovery, only the leaders uh, got the Nobel Prize formally, although on, all of us were excited and honored to be recognized in this way. Saul Perlmutter at Berkeley led the Supernova Cosmology Project, and at one time I was a member of his team. 
I then switched over to the team led by Brian Schmidt of the Australian National University, the so-called High Redshift Supernova Search Team. Uh, and my postdoctoral scholar at the time that we did, did work, Adam Rees, was honored with the prize as well. He was the first, the leading author on the paper on Schmidt's team that reported the results. Uh, Alpar said that maybe I would care to comment on having been a member of both teams, the only person to have been a member. You'll have to get me a little bit more drunk before I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> before I'm willing to discuss that. But uh, yes, it, it is an interesting story. Anyway. I'm happy to have contributed. I'm the, I'm the only person to have been on, on both teams. Well, these gentlemen realized that without the hard work of the rest of us, they wouldn't have been honored in this way. So they were kind enough to spend a good fraction of their prize money flying all the rest of us out to Stockholm in December of, 9th, of 2011 to help participate in Nobel Week. So we went to a nonstop series of parties and receptions and wonderful gatherings. Um, the only thing we really didn't uh, partake of is the getting of the gold medal itself and the million dollars that goes along with it. So uh, anyway, but, but here we are on Schmidt's team right after the award to Brian Schmidt and my postdoctoral scholar, Adam Rees. We gathered very quickly for a photograph after the award. And because I could not be in two places at the same time, I'm not in the picture of the other team, but oh well, that's the way it goes. We had a very fun time there, and it was really such an honor. But really, the great pleasure was in making the discovery and doing the science. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would contribute in a, such an important way to a discovery that really revolutionized our view of the world and the way in which uh, physics views the world these days. And I will tell you the implications of our discovery in this talk. So this talk is, of course, generically on astronomy, but more specifically, it's on cosmology. Cosmology is that subset of astronomy that deals with the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole, in its entirety. We're interested in truly some of the grandest questions imaginable. How big is the universe? Is it infinite? Or does it wrap around itself somehow? What shape is it? How old is the universe? Is it infinitely old? No, it's not infinitely old. It's about 14 billion years old. In fact, the most recent measurements suggest 13.80, sorry, 13.80 plus or minus 0 0.04 billion years old. Now that's very, very old, but it's not infinitely old. So we now know how old the universe is, and this was a big time story. You see that, a big time story. When did the universe begin? Well, we're also interested in the fate of the universe. Will it expand forever? It's currently expanding, or will it recollapse someday? This too was a big time story. How the universe will end, and this was written in 2001 about the work that we had done. Then. 12 years ago, we thought we knew how the universe would end. Now, a dozen years later, we've done more research, and we're not so sure how it will end. But I will tell you how it might end, what the probabilities are. <laughs> we're also interested in the fundamental building blocks of the universe. Those are galaxies. Now, galaxies are gigantic collections of stars, maybe a few hundred billion stars, gravitationally bound into a structure like this one, a spiral galaxy in this case, 100,000 light years across. So if you were on a planet orbiting a star here and you sent a message to a friend at the speed of light using radio waves over to here saying, hey, let's go to the lecture this afternoon, it would take 100,000 years for your message to get there and another 100,000 years to come back. So that would be a round trip conversation of 200,000 years, hardly a stimulating conversation, but I'm sorry, this is just the way the universe is built. It's built out of these gigantic galaxies, truly almost unimaginable. A light year is 10 tr million million kilometers. It's the distance light travels in a year, and light could travel around the Earth seven times in a second if it were to go in a curved path. So these are enormous distances, okay? But this is not our only galaxy in the universe. There are galaxies all over the place. Let me give you some idea of this. Here's one of my favorite photographs. It's part of what's called the Hubble Space Telescope 
ultra deep field. The telescope stared at one spot in the sky for the equivalent of about two weeks over a course of many months. It looked every once in a while at the spot and built up the signal until it could see the light from many faint galaxies. All these little blobs here are galaxies like our Milky Way. There are very few stars in this picture in our own Milky Way. There's a star, there's a star. All the others are galaxies. There's a few thousand of them there. And that's in a part of the sky that's about the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Hold out your arm like this and imagine how small a grain of sand looks. That's how big this patch of the sky is. And yet it has thousands of galaxies. I could count them. One, two, three, four, five. I could use up my hour counting galaxies and that would be pretty boring for you. But, you know, it's a, a rather cushy job. They pay us to sit around and count galaxies, okay? Anyway, don't tell too many people. We, we don't need too many astrophysicists in the world. But anyway, we've taken a number of such photographs. Hello, Kitty, here to learn about cosmology. Um, we've taken a number of such pictures and we realize that this is the typical view. It's representative. So if we extrapolate over the whole sky, we see that within the realm of today's greatest telescopes, there's something like 100 billion galaxies, each with tens or hundreds of billions of stars. And that's just in the parts of the universe that we can see. We now have good reasons to think that the universe extends far, far beyond the parts that we can see. And everywhere it's filled with these galaxies, the basic building blocks of the universe. So how do they form? How do they evolve with time? These two are among the central questions of cosmology. So you can see what an exciting, vibrant field it is. And I feel very privileged to have been able to do research in this field. Now, before I move on, let me point out that among the general public, present company excluded, there's considerable confusion between cosmology, the study of the structure and evolution of the universe as a whole, and cosmetology, the study of hairdos and facials. <laughs> they do sound similar, I must admit, but they are spelled differently. In fact, if you write them down, it's a curious thing. Cosmetology is just cosmology with an extra ET in it, like the extraterrestrial, you know, ET. I don't know the cosmic significance of that, but that's how they're spelled, all right? Now, you might think, this is crazy, you know, there, no one could possibly have this confusion. But I'm a scientist, let me give you evidence. Here's a copy of an ad that a colleague of mine placed in my mailbox some time ago. Make cosmology your career. Training and supervision in hairstyling, blow drying, permanent waves, coloring and frosting. You, you laugh, but these are very important topics, okay? Scalp treatments, body and skin care, style cuts, basic cuts. For further information and interviews, call that number. Well, classes started back in March, so you missed the current term. But I'm sure it will be offered at your local college or university, if not here at Bo 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 Boazici University, in the next term, maybe in the summer or in the fall. So if you want to do as many of my colleagues and I have done and get to the cutting edge of this field, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I like puns, you need to take uh, a course like this. Now these people need a course obviously not only on their own profession, but of course in spelling and proofreading because in addition to Futher here, you see hair slying, see that hair slying. <laughs> And coloring, well, that's the British spelling, and my own thesis advisor was British, so I'll allow that one. But, you know, maybe their spell checker wasn't working or something. This is, of course, an ad before spell checkers existed. But anyway, they don't even know their own field. But actually, this reminds me. My father-in-law says, you know, Alex, the only real difference between the cosmology course that you teach at Berkeley and a course on cosmetology is that you don't give makeup exams. <laughs> Oh my goodness, He's... puns are a highly underappreciated form of humor, humor but uh, my father and I bo both like them a lot, so. Okay, well, let me move on. A fundamental figure in this field of cosmology was Edwin Hubble, who did many great things. He studied these giant clouds of gas in the sky, the so-called spiral nebulae, 
And he was the first to show quite definitively that they are galaxies outside our own Milky Way rather than clouds of gas within the Milky Way. And he used a certain technique that I'll describe in a minute to determine their distances so he can tell how far away they are. And he studied their spectra. He passed the light of a galaxy through a prism or another device like this and produced a rainbow, a spectrum. And the process of studying spectra, spectroscopy, is used by all kinds of scientists to understand the objects that they are studying. For example, by measuring the brightness of the light as a function of color or wavelength of the light, you can determine the temperature of the gases and the pressure and the chemical composition. For example, these dark streaks here are caused by atoms in the relatively cool outer atmospheres of stars. This, for example, is hydrogen. Here is neutral sodium. These lines here are due to singly ionized calcium. So we're trained to understand these fingerprints of atoms. Well, the spectrum can also tell you whether the object is coming toward you or away from you. If it's coming toward you, the spectrum looks the same, the same pattern of lines, but they're all shifted toward bluer colors, shorter wavelengths of light, a blue shift. And if it's moving away from you, then the pattern is shifted toward redder colors or longer wavelengths. Now, you're familiar with this in terms of the audible Doppler effect. When a siren is coming toward you, the pitch sounds high because between the emission of two consecutive wave crests, the object has moved toward you, so the two wave crests are now closer together. That makes a higher pitch, a shorter wavelength. And conversely, when it's moving away from you, during the time between two wave crests, it has moved away, and so the wavelength is stretched. So when a siren goes past you, you can hear this like that. And if a siren is going, yeah, 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 it doesn't mean that the driver is drunk and can't make up his mind which way to go. There are some sirens that are not constant pitch, but you can hear the pitch go from a high-pitched ia to a low-pitched ia. Well, light does the same sort of thing. And what Hubble noticed was that relatively near, nearby galaxies are moving away from us slowly, okay? More distant galaxies are moving away from us more quickly. And even more distant galaxies are moving away from us even more quickly. So in terms of motion, if you in interpret this redshift in terms of motion, it suggests that all the galaxies are moving away from ours, perhaps through a pre-existing space, like bullets moving through a room or through the air. We now understand that the so-called cosmological redshift is caused not by the classical Doppler effect, not by objects moving through a pre-existing space, but rather by the stretching of space itself. So we think the universe itself is expanding and light stretches with that expansion. Now we're not expanding because we're held together by electromagnetic forces that overcome the tendency of space to expand. So despite what you might think after a large lunch, you're not expanding. Well, maybe you are, but that's not the universe's fault, that's your fault, okay? And the Earth isn't expanding because it's held together by gravity. And our solar system and our Milky Way galaxy are not expanding because they're held together by gravity as well. But far from any galaxies, space is unconstrained and it expands. And light traveling through that space starts out perhaps with a short wavelength, a blue wavelength, and then it gets stretched, becoming progressively more redshifted. So the bigger the distance, the greater the amount of stretching, the faster it appears the object is moving away from us. And it is moving away faster, but not because of its motion through space, rather because space itself is stretching. So here's our perspective. We're sitting here, come on, computer, in the Milky Way galaxy, and all these other galaxies are moving away from ours. And right now, at a given time, the more distant galaxies are moving faster than the nearby galaxies. And the modern interpretation is that space is expanding. Now, before I move on, let me pause, because there's something a bit peculiar about this diagram as I've drawn it. What's strange about it? Yeah, yeah why are we at the center? Exactly right. Do these other galaxies not like us? 
Is it something we said or do we smell? Are all these other galaxies lactose intolerant? Get it? Milky Way galaxy, lactose intolerant galaxy? Oh, yeah. Or when I tell my introductory astronomy students at Berkeley, when I tell them about the expansion of the universe, I say, what's the problem? Are we from Stanford or something? <laughs> With due apologies to those of you who might be Stanford alumni. You know, it's a big rival of Berkeley, academic and, uh, and sports. It's a great institution. It's outstanding, actually, but just not quite as outstanding as, as Berkeley. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> Well, no, we don't think we, that we live in any special place. We think that we would see this expansion away from us no matter which galaxy we happen to live in. And let me give you an example of a one-dimensional universe where the ping pong balls are the galaxies. They don't stretch. And the rubber is the space between them. You can see that from the perspective of this ping pong ball, all the others are moving away. But the same can be said from the perspective of any other ping pong ball. They all think that the others are moving away. And don't worry about the ends of the cord here. The universe is either infinite or it wraps around itself. So you don't have to worry about an edge. Notice also that the more distant galaxies, this yellow one, for example, compared to the red one, they move away faster from this one than the more nearby one. And that's because every bit of space expands. And the more space there was to begin with, the greater will be the total amount of expansion. So you get Hubble's relationship. This works also for three-dimensional universes. Here's an expanding loaf of raisin bread. The dough is uniformly filled with yeast, and let's say we let it bake for an hour. Suppose it doubles in size. This raisin sees all the other raisins moving away from it. So it thinks it's at the center, but any other raisin sees all others moving away as well. There's no unique center, at least not in the dimensions that we can physically probe. There may be a center in another mathematically describable but physically inaccessible dimension. I won't get into that unless people ask about it in the Q&A session. Again, don't worry about the edge. The universe is either infinite or it wraps around, okay? So you get the Hubble relationship. And with today's great telescopes, we've measured how fast the universe is expanding right now. It's just some number. It's an interesting number, but I don't want to dwell on it right now. What I want to talk about is how that number will change. The universe shouldn't expand at the same rate forever. And this goes all the way back to Newton. The concept goes all the way back to Newton. He supposedly saw an apple fall from the apple tree. And he wondered whether whatever it is that makes it fall is somehow related to what keeps the moon in its orbit around the Earth. And he developed his law of universal gravitation. We now th think that it applies universally. And he used that together with his newly developed laws of motion to understand that indeed, the motion of the moon and the motion of the apple are intimately related. Science brings together, it explains under a common umbrella, seemingly diverse phenomena. And you can't give a talk about gravity without using the proverbial Newtonian apple, so here it is. Anyway, when I toss the apple up, the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the apple slows it down. In fact, it slows it down so much that it comes to a stop and then comes crashing back. So if the universe is sufficiently dense, then all volumes will be pulling on all other volumes a lot slowing down the expansion of the universe until it comes to a halt. So it's currently expanding, but all the galaxies are pulling on all other galaxies. That expansion should be slowing down. If the universe is sufficiently dense, that expansion will someday stop and the universe will implode. It will collapse in on itself. So you could say in that case that the universe starts with a big bang and ends with a big crunch, a hot, compressed state. Or you could say, Big Bang, Gnab Gib, which is Big Bang backwards. Write them down. <laughs> Big Bang, Gnab Gib. So that's one possible fate of the universe. So imagine you're lying on your back and you live for billions of years and you're seeing galaxies moving away from you, getting ever fainter and smaller. And then you notice something strange. They're getting bigger and brighter and you start feeling a bit nervous at this point. And then it's goodbye, cruel world. The universe collapses in on you. So that's one possible fate for the universe. But there's another possibility. 
If there weren't the ceiling here, and if I could throw fast enough, I could in principle heave this apple at a speed such that it never comes back to earth. It either approaches zero speed as time approaches infinity, or it approaches some constant non-zero speed as time approaches infinity, but it definitely doesn't turn around. That would be an apple thrown at or greater than Earth's escape speed, about 11 kilometers per second. So if the universe isn't very dense, then yes, all the galaxies are pulling on all other galaxies, slowing down the expansion, but it should never halt. It'll slow down, maybe it will halt as time approaches infinity, but it will never turn around. In that case, the universe would expand eternally. And if you were lying on your back, you would see the galaxies becoming fainter, smaller, forever. And the universe would become a very cold, dark, lonely place. So those are the two possible fates. We want to know what will happen to the universe, regardless of whether it has any practical consequences to life as we know it right now. We just want to know because we're curious. And moreover, studying things like this will teach us more about the universe, the laws of nature, and who knows what practical spin-offs there might be. I like to say that a century ago, the quantum physicists, Einstein, Heisenberg, Bohr, Schrodinger, had not the slightest practical application in mind when they were developing quantum physics. They just wanted to understand how atoms work and the nature of radiation. Today, we could not imagine our high-tech world without computers, lasers, cell phones, all kinds of things that require an understanding of the world at the microscopic level. You know, with today's chips, there's like a trillion transistors on the head of a pin. You can't do that unless you understand microphysics. And it all stems from quantum mechanics a century ago. They couldn't have imagined what the world would be like today. So who knows what this might lead to? Well, how do we determine the fate of the universe? Let's go back to the apple example. If we measure the speed of the apple at many different points in its trajectory, and we see that it's slowing down a lot, then it will someday stop and come back down. If we measure it and see that it isn't slowing down very much, then it'll expand forever. So in a similar way, you can examine the past history of the expansion of the universe in order to predict the future. That's the idea. Compare the rate of expansion at many different times in the past and see if it's been slowing down enough to ever stop. Well, you might say that we can measure the current rate of expansion, but how can we go back into the past and measure what it used to be? It seems impossible because we live right now. Anyone want to venture a guess? How can we look back into the past? Who said that? Where? What's your name? Will says, basically, you see things further away as they were further back in time. And that's because light travels at a not infinite speed, but finite. Very fast, but finite. About a foot per billionth of a second. About that fast. You can tell this fact to your friends at the next party you attend, thus ensuring that you will never again be invited to a party. But anyway, about a foot per billionth of a second, a foot per nanosecond. So I'm seeing Will, not as he is right now, but as he was perhaps 60 billionths of a second ago. He may not even exist anymore. Oh, he does. Good. Good for him. He's still on this good earth, okay? You see the sun as it was about eight and one-third minutes ago because that's how long it takes for the light to traverse 150 million kilometers. The typical stars you see with your naked eye are some tens or hundreds, in a few cases a thousand light years away. So you're seeing them as they were 10, 100, 1,000 years ago. So if you look at galaxies that are a billion light years away and four billion light years away, and maybe that little tiny dot there is nine billion light years away, you're seeing them as they were one, four, nine billion years ago and encoded in the light in the form of the redshift is information about how much the universe has expanded 
during the time that the light has been traveling. One billion years, four billion years, nine billion years. You look at the redshift as a function of the distance. And that will be different. That relationship will be different if the universe has been slowing down a lot or not very much. Okay, so you can trace the expansion history of the universe if you determine the distances of galaxies. How do we determine the distances of galaxies? Well, this is the method that Hubble used, at least for nearby galaxies. You take pictures like this, and let's say you can identify that star, and all the stars are not all the same. They come in different categories. Suppose you call that star Alper, just, just for kicks. And you study it, and you notice that it's the same kind of a star as this one here, Betelgeuse, the left shoulder, as seen by us of the great hunter Orion. Here are the two shoulders, the head, the uh, sword, I'm sorry, the belt, the sword, the feet. We know that this is a powerful, luminous, magnificent star. And it's sufficiently nearby that we can determine its distance. We can measure how bright it looks so we can determine how powerful it really is. If Alper is exactly the same kind of star, then by looking at how faint Alper appears to be, we can determine how far away Alper is, and hence how far away the entire galaxy is. And we can choose some other stars, Jevza and others, just to see if we get the, get the same answer. And if we do, this builds confidence in the technique. And Hubble used a type of star known as a Cepheid variable star. That's a bit of a technicality, but for those who want to know, he used a particularly luminous, powerful type of star, even more powerful than Betelgeuse. It's called a Cepheid variable. Now, you use this technique all the time when you judge the distance of an oncoming car at night. You've calibrated how bright the headlights are of a car that's nearby, maybe two meters away. Whoa, those are bright headlights. You then look at fainter headlights, and you determine how far away the car is, effectively by making this comparison of the apparent brightness with the known true luminosity or power. This is almost intuitive, almost instinctive. I mean, if you're not very good at doing this, then you shouldn't be driving at night, okay? <laughs> Your brain gets a consistency check in looking at how far apart the headlights appear. The farther apart uh, they are, the closer the car is. Anyway, cars, stars, it's the same technique. Find a star whose true power you know, look at how bright it appears to be, thus you determine the distance, and hence how far back in time you are looking. The finite speed of light gives you a movie of the history of the universe. Well, that may sound fine in principle, but you might say, gee, these galaxies consist of billions of stars, but they're so far away that we can't see them individually. They all merge together. They're too faint individually to see. So how do you know that this galaxy is four billion light years away and not pi or 5.6 or something like that. How do you truly know the distance if you can't see any stars within it? Ah, but there is one type of star that's so powerful that can, it can be seen even from distances of billions of light years. Anyone know what kind of star that is? Several people said it, I think. Supernova, that's right. An exploding star. Some stars explode at the end of their lives, becoming up to a few billion times as powerful as our sun. Here's an example of a star that exploded, and it takes several weeks to brighten and some months to fade. But at its brightest, it is as powerful as several billion suns. It's as bright as the central region of this galaxy. Now, our sun will not do this. It's not the right type of star. That's good. If the sun were to explode, sunblock of 50 just wouldn't cut it, folks. You'd need sunblock or supernova block of a few billion to protect yourself. But don't worry. Be happy. The sun will not explode. Okay. If we find a whole bunch of these exploding stars in galaxies whose distance we already know because we've measured more normal stars within them, so here's a normal star, there's a normal star. We know the distance of this galaxy. If we measure how bright the supernova is, we can determine how powerful it really is. And we have to do this for a bunch of supernovae because after all, there might be more than one way in which a star can explode. Indeed, there are several different ways. 
Cosmologists are interested in a particular type of supernova called type 1A. I don't want to dwell on that, uh, but if you want to look it up some more, type 1A are the one we are interested in because they're, the, they're, they're quite uniform. They're all pretty much the same, and they're very, very powerful. Okay? So we have to find them in nearby galaxies, but that's not an easy task because a typical galaxy might produce a supernova maybe once every 30 years or 40 years. So if I were a really cruel advisor, I would have each of my students staring through the eyepiece of a telescope at one and only one galaxy, preferably at night. You see more stars and galaxies at night than during the day. Until that student finds a supernova, and then we let that student graduate and move on to greener pastures. <laughs> well, you know, meanwhile, I will have had decades worth of slave labor from this student, and that would not be right. There are some crimes that are so egregious that even a tenured professor can and should get fired at Berkeley, at Bogodici, um, you know, anywhere. So I don't do that to my students. Instead, you can look at thousands of galaxies. If it's, say, once every 30 years per galaxy, then if you look at thousands of galaxies, you, you improve your odds of finding a supernova. So I could have my students looking at thousands of galaxies, but that would be cruel and un unusual punishment as well. Instead, with today's modern technology, we attach digital cameras, CCD cameras, to the back end of telescopes. We take photographs of thousands of galaxies, and then we simply look for arrows. And where you see arrows, you see exploding stars. You see once, twice, three times, four times, five times. By rigorous mathematical induction, I conclude that this process must work every time. Well, it can't, it can't be quite that easy. You know, we, we, we don't really have arrows marking the locations of, of exploding stars in the sky, right? So um, we have to find them some other way. So what we've developed is a robotic telescope that takes photographs for us repeatedly of many thousands of galaxies and it compares the new photographs with the old photographs. Usually there's nothing new in the new photograph, but occasionally there is a new star. Actually, this looks new too, but that was put in using Adobe Photoshop or something. Anyway, that's the supernova, okay? So we find them in nearby galaxies, galaxies whose distances we know. Here's a particularly bright one that we studied in a very nearby galaxy just two years ago. This was a fantastic type 1a supernova in this beautiful galaxy. Okay, so even 20 years ago, we had calibrated these type 1a supernovae pretty well. Since then, we've been refining the technique, making them even better. But even 20 years ago, the technique was already pretty good. So two teams set out to find distant examples of these type 1a's. If they can find them in distant galaxies, they would be able to measure the brightness and thus determine the distance of the galaxy. And moreover, by measuring the redshift, we would find out how much the universe has expanded during the time that the light traveled toward us. So if we could find a distant type 1a, we figure out the distance of the galaxy, that is how far back in time we're looking, and we measure the amount of stretching. So we can determine what the universe has been doing in the past because the relationship between redshift and time in the past differs depending on whether the universe is slowing down quickly or not very quickly and so on. Well, both teams used telescopes primarily in Chile. There are very good weather conditions in Chile. And they used cameras that were able to take quite wide angle pictures of the sky. This picture is about the size of the full moon. Uh, which is pretty good for a big telescope. Most big telescopes only look at a very small fraction of this size. By the way, the full moon is not rectangular in shape, but nevertheless, this is about the size of the full moon. And here you see, as in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, you see literally thousands of galaxies. Nearly every blob you see here is a galaxy. When you look out with your unaided eye, the sky is dominated by stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. But when you use big telescopes and you take a long exposure, you quickly run out of stars, and instead you see mostly galaxies. So if we take many such pictures throughout the night of different parts of the sky, and then repeat the process three weeks later, 
Some of those 100,000 galaxies, maybe, will have produced a type 1a supernova. And we can find it by digitally subtracting the old image from the new image. So here is a small subset of an image of one of these big ones here, okay, taken on the 7th of April, 1997. These are our actual data. And then three weeks later, you digitally subtract this one from that one. You get lots of noise. That's okay. Any measurement process necessarily has some noise associated with it. You can't escape that. But here, cleverly placed in the center of the square, is something that looks like it might be real. And another picture of it with the Hubble, three weeks later, shows it again. And it's marked with an arrow, so you know it has to be a supernova, okay? Well, you don't really know. The way to be sure is to take the spectrum, to get a fingerprint of the object. And that was my main task on both teams. I'm a spectroscopist by training. I've studied supernovae for decades, ever since 1985. And I have access to the world's greatest optical telescopes. They're on the volcanic island of, uh, the big island of Hawaii, on a volcano called Mauna Kea. And these are fantastic machines. Each of them consists of a mirror 10 meters in diameter. Actually, it's not a single mirror, it's 36 hexagonal segments arranged in the form of a honeycomb. And there are computers and measurement devices that keep the overall shape precisely what it needs to be at all times. It's just fantastic. It works wonderfully. Here is Fred Chaffee, a former director of the observatory, giving you some perspective of how, how big this is. Think of a telescope as a gigantic eye collecting up light. Now, he usually wasn't there when we were taking data. This is just a public relations shot. But uh, anyway, it gives you some idea of how big these machines are. Yeah, the extra light gathering power provided by the pupil of his eye is dwarfed by the glass here. So, okay. So I took spectra of these type 1a supernovae and figured out whether they really were type 1a's. And so here are a few examples of them in three galaxies. There it is before and after, and it's marked with an arrow. And the punchline is the following. These are very faint, very faint supernovae. And you might say, well, they're in very faint, obviously distant galaxies. Here, the galaxy isn't even really visible. This must be a very distant galaxy. So you might think, obviously, the supernovae should appear faint. That's true. But they appear fainter than they have any right to be. Interpreted in terms of distance, they're all too far away. They're farther away than can be expected in a reasonably behaved universe. Let me give you an example. Going back to the apple, I love the apple analogy. Suppose there's been only one second since the Big Bang. Okay, one second since the apple left my hand. I can measure the apple's distance from my hand after one second. That's just some number. But the apple has been slowing down, right? If you make the mass of the earth less, then the apple won't slow down as much. Now, I, I can't make the mass of the earth less, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can do the next best thing. I can, I can throw the apple faster, and you can see that in one second it goes a greater distance. The same would be the case if the earth's mass were less, okay? So in one second it gets to a greater distance. If the earth were not here at all, no mass, and you forget about the sun and Jupiter and everything else, if I toss the apple, would it have any reason whatsoever to slow down? No, that's just Newton's first law of motion. It keeps on going with the same speed in the same direction. So in one second, it would go an even greater distance. Everyone follow that? Okay. That's as far as you can get in a universe that only has gravity in it or no gravity. If there's no gravity, it gets farther in one second than it does if there is gravity. But we measured the supernovae, the galaxies in which they're located, the apple, to be a greater distance than the maximum distance possible, even had it not been slowing down at all. So unless there's some other weird thing going on, and we had to rule out possible effects one by one, but the obvious Solution, if you rule out everything else, is what? Instead of slowing down, the universe has been speeding up. If you attach a rocket to this apple and it goes zoop, 
then in one second, it could achieve a greater distance than it would have had there been no gravity. Right? So it's as though there's a rocket attached to the thing. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, a more obvious solution might be that the universe is two seconds old. If it's two seconds old, obviously, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. I tossed it up into that, yeah, into that, into that bright supernova there. Um, if it's two seconds old, obviously the apple goes farther. And so you might think that the flaw is in the assumed age of the universe, 13.8 billion years. Maybe that's wrong. If that's what you were thinking, good try. But it turns out that the argument in detail is independent of the assumed age of the universe. The implied distance of each supernova was greater than expected based on its redshift in any universe that's slowing down or even a universe that's expanding at a constant speed. In other words, for every redshift, we expect a certain distance, and the measured distance was greater than any of the expectations. Okay? So the headlines that came out were astronomers see a cosmic anti-gravity force at work. And we use this term, anti-gravity, hesitantly, because people ask us, can we attach this stuff, whatever it is, to our cars and levitate over Istanbul traffic jams, okay? And the answer is no, we can't attach this stuff. It's either a property of space that cannot be harnessed, or there's so little of it that effectively we will never get enough of it. But it has an anti-gravity-like property in that it causes space to expand faster and faster. We made this announcement, actually I was privileged to be able to make the announcement for the Schmidt team at a meeting in Los Angeles in February of 1998. By the end of 1998, no one had found any clear flaws in what we had done. So the editors of Science Magazine proclaimed this to be the most important discovery in all areas of science that year. Um, Either we were right, or if we we're wrong, we're wrong for some subtle reason that will end up teaching us something interesting about the universe. And that's how science operates. You never prove anything beyond any shadow of a doubt. You're always improving things. So the caricature of Einstein is surprised here. You might think it's because he's blowing multiple universes out of his pipe. You might not have known that there are multiple universes and that they come from the pipes of theoretical physicists. Well, maybe the first part of that statement is true. Maybe there are multiple universes. We don't know. It's a hypothesis. But we don't think that they come from the pipes of physicists. No. He's surprised because this one universe is expanding faster and faster with time rather than more and more slowly as had been expected. He's doubly surprised because there's a sheaf of papers under his arm where there's an equation. The Greek letter lambda equals eight pi g times the density of the vacuum. Now you might say, what is Filipenko talking about? You were taught on your mother's knee that the vacuum is sheer nothingness. It's empty, zero, zilch. How can we be talking about a non-zero density, that is mass or energy per unit volume, of the vacuum? Well, this was Einstein's idea, not mine. I'm just the messenger here. He proposed this in 1917 in order to explain the apparently static nature of the universe. Hubble had not yet made the discovery of the expansion. Einstein and most other physicists thought that the universe is static, neither collapsing nor expanding. Yet galaxies should be pulling on one another. So if anything, the universe should be collapsing in on itself, imploding but the sky doesn't look like it's falling. And Einstein found a static universe to be aesthetically pleasing. So he made up a fudge factor in the solution of his equations. It was a valid mathematical solution, but it seemed contrived. It was the so-called cosmological constant, a source of force in a sense, opposite to that of gravity, and exactly equal in size. So if the down arrow is balanced by the up arrow, the net force 
between two galaxies would be zero and they wouldn't accelerate toward one another. It's like this apple. The earth is pulling down on it, but if my hand pulls up at exactly the same force, then the apple is stationary. There is no net force. In the Star Wars movies, you know, you remember those? May the force be with you. No, George Lucas got it wrong. May the net force be with you, right? <laughs> the force may be with you, but if some other force is against you, you're going to lose. So Lucas needs to go back and take freshman physics, okay? May the net force be with you. Now, Einstein did not like this because though it was a valid solution of his equations, it implied that the vacuum has a non-zero density, which seemed like nonsense. And there was no experimental laboratory evidence for the vacuum being this way. And moreover, he needed a precise value this up arrow had to be the same size as the down arrow, and that seemed very arbitrary. It seemed very unlikely. Even if there is energy associated with the vacuum, and even if it is repulsive, why should it exactly balance gravity? Einstein did not like this, but he felt compelled to introduce it. A dozen years later, Hubble found that the universe isn't static after all. It's expanding. We don't know how it began precisely, but once it begins, no forces are needed to continue the expansion. So the whole physical and philosophical motivation for the cosmological constant vanished, and Einstein renounced the idea as having been the biggest blunder of his career. Had he not introduced it, he could have been famous. You know, he could have predicted that the universe is not static. So here he is, sad, that he ever introduced the idea of the cosmological constant. Now, I don't know that that's what he's thinking, but it might be what he's thinking, okay? What have we done the better part of a century later? We've reincarnated the idea, not to give a static universe, but one which on the largest distances is expanding faster and faster with time. So here in this room, the down arrow dominates. In our solar system, down. In our galaxy, down. In our local group of galaxies, again, down. But over distances of tens or hundreds of millions of light years, the up arrow begins to dominate. And overall, the universe expands faster and faster with time. So rather than being his greatest blunder, which he renounced, the idea of this repulsive effect may have been his greatest intellectual triumph. And his only error was in giving it a mathematically unlikely value exactly equal to that of gravity. So if Einstein were around right now to see the data, maybe his reaction would be something like this. You know, we, we don't know. But I think he would be delighted to see the evidence. So what is this effect that's causing the accelerating expansion of the universe? We don't know exactly. It's not the visible matter in the universe because visible matter is all gravitationally attractive. It's also not antimatter. Antimatter is also gravitationally attractive. It's also not dark matter. How many of you have heard of dark matter? Yes, there's dark matter there, 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 there. Actually, we know that there's dark matter in clusters of galaxies like this. Fritz Zwicky, one of my heroes, first considered this in the 1930s. He looked at galaxies in a cluster and he saw that they were moving around very, very quickly. So quickly that the cluster of galaxies would fly apart. And he postulated that there's maybe extra material there holding things together. This was back in the 1930s. Zwicky was ahead of his time, decades ahead of his time. And most of his colleagues didn't pay attention to him. They didn't like him very much. He was brilliant, but he was arrogant and abrasive. And he did not think highly of the intellectual capabilities of his colleagues. And, and this is at the California Institute of Technology, one of the greatest scientific institutions in the world, okay? A lot of smart people. And here, perhaps he's showing us what he thinks of the typical brain size of his colleagues, okay? <laughs> now, I don't know, again, that that's what he's thinking, but he is quoted as having referred to his colleagues as spherical bastards because you know they're bastards any way you look at them 
and a sphere is the only thing that looks the same from all directions. You know? Anyway, you can kind of see why his colleagues didn't like him very much, but his ideas were ignored largely. Decades later, in the 1970s, Vera Rubin and other astronomers found that galaxies are spinning too quickly. They would fall apart as well, unless there were extra material holding them together. together. So she and other people reincarnated this idea of, of dark matter. And now the study of dark matter is one of the most important in all of astrophysics. But dark matter holds things together, galaxies and clusters of galaxies. It does not cause things to spread apart faster and faster with time. We need something new, a new idea. And perhaps regrettably, the substance is now called dark energy. Dark because, like dark matter, it's invisible. Also, it's mysterious. We don't know the origin, so it's dark in that sense. But I don't like the term because many people are familiar with one equation in physics. What is that equation? E equals mc squared. So people are always asking, are dark matter and dark energy the same thing? And they're not. Dark matter pulls dark energy pushes. But this is the term and it's here to stay and you will read about it in the newspapers and magazines. In honor of the Nobel Prize and in a sense as a consolation prize for all of us who did not officially get the Nobel Prize, my wife Noelle made these t-shirts. Dark energy is the new black. <laughs> Do you know that term? You know something that's really great is the new black. So anyway, here it is. Dark energy is the new black. This stuff is important and mysterious. Averaged over gigantic volumes, let's say a billion light years in diameter, this is the composition of the universe. 70% dark energy, 25% dark matter, only 5% regular matter made out of atoms, protons, and neutrons. Now this is not the pie in this room, or at Boazichi University, or in our galaxy. But over a big enough volume, this is what the universe consists of. And there's dark energy here in this room, but just an infinitesimal amount of it. It makes no difference in this room, but it makes a big difference to the universe as a whole. So we need to understand what this stuff is. This stuff is probably the most important observationally motivated problem in physics today. What is the true origin and nature of dark energy? Followed by what is the origin and nature of dark matter? You know, 95% of the universe is this stuff. What we consist of is just this. And by the way, only half a percent is easily visible ordinary matter in the form of stars and gas. Four and a half percent is actually dead stars or hot gas, which is actually hard to detect. Only half a percent is in the form of stars. So we are a minor constituent of the universe. I like to say we are almost the debris of the universe, the afterthought of creation. That's not to say that you're not important to your family, your friends, your loved ones. You are important, obviously. But you don't consist of the main constituents of the universe. The main constituents are dark energy followed by dark matter. So we should understand what these things are. Moreover, it's thought that the dark energy may provide a clue to the unification of quantum physics and general relativity, the two great pillars of modern physics. Quantum physics refers to the physics of the very small. It's spectacularly successful. General relativity refers to the physics of the very large. It too appears to be incredibly successful. Although, by the way, maybe the acceleration of the universe is caused not by dark energy, but by a failure of general relativity. That's a possibility, but more physicists think that dark energy exists and that general relativity is correct. These two theories work in their own domains beautifully well, but when you try to bring them together and consider a large amount of matter in a very small volume, these two fundamental pillars of modern physics are at war with one another. They're completely incompatible, and this is not an acceptable situation. We cannot claim to have an understanding of nature when our two greatest 
ideas are fundamentally incompatible with one another. Well, it is thought by many that an explanation of the dark energy will come in the form of quantum physics, but applied to the whole universe. In other words, there's dark energy everywhere, and dark energy is a quantum phenomenon, but because it is everywhere, it dominates the behavior of the universe as a whole, and thus we have to bring in general relativity as well. So any theory of quantum gravity, certain types of string theory, for example, that is incompatible with this acceleration of the universe can be rejected as not being a viable theory of everything. So this is why this dark energy is important. I only talked about the supernova observations, but the result has been confirmed by other types of studies in many ways over the 13 years following 1998. And that's why eventually the Nobel Committee decided to award the prize for this discovery, because the acceleration seems to be beyond doubt now. We don't know what the dark energy is, but that's a new mystery to be solved. The acceleration appears to be without a doubt, all right? And now we need to explain what all this stuff is. Well, what will be the future? If the dark energy continues to be repulsive, then the universe will expand faster and faster with time forever, a runaway universe, so to speak. So if you want to see galaxies with your very own eyes through a telescope, you had better go over to your university or planetarium and look through a telescope sometime soon in the next few tens of billions of years. Because beyond that time, the galaxies will be whisked away to such great distances that they will fade from view and the universe will be very cold and dark and lonely. So that's what will happen to the universe if the dark energy remains repulsive. This is what we thought would be the case in 2001 when we were interviewed about our discovery. But since that time, theoretical physicists have pointed out that there are possible versions of dark energy whose sign changes in the future. Right now it's repulsive, but it could became, become attractive in the future. If that's the case, and if there's enough of it, then it's conceivable that although the universe is accelerating right now, it will someday decelerate, perhaps even stop, and collapse in on itself. So it's still possible that the universe will recollapse, although my bet is that it will expand faster and faster forever. Well, the American poet Robert Frost certainly did not know about dark energy. But he was sufficiently well-educated to know that the universe can have one of two possible fates. And imploding on itself, becoming hot and compressed, hot like fire. Or expanding eternally, becoming cold like ice and dark and lonely. He wrote this famous poem, Fire and Ice. It goes like this. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. So you see, Frost would prefer the collapsing universe that ends in fire. But if the universe and he had to perish twice, then eternal expansion and an ending in ice would be okay with him. And that's perhaps appropriate, given his name, Robert Frost. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you. We just sent you a note for an announcement. Uh, we will have now some questions uh, and answers. Uh, and then uh, there are repressions, some repressions stronger than the others, as <laughs> uh, always on the uh, whole. Yes, and I will repeat the questions for the benefit of everyone. Okay, okay? yes. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, I will repeat them, sure. Yeah. Oh, if there's a microphone, then I don't have to. Yeah. Um, first of all, my friend Oya wants to know, is that a real apple you have there? 
I'm sorry? <laughs> is that a real apple you have? It, it is a real apple, but now it is bruised because it fell to the ground. But one half of it is still quite good, and if you would like it, I'll no, be happy you. to give it to you. But now, now I've got a... Uh, the unsung hero of all this, as you well know, is uh, George's Lemaitre. Yes, Lemaitre, and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, what I didn't know about him until fairly recently is that he suggested an accelerating universe as early as 1931. Yeah, yeah. Um, so did Willem de Zitter. In fact, de Zitter thought that the universe's expansion is driven mm. by something like the cosmological constant. Mm. Mm. That, I believe, is specifically de Zitter. And uh, Lemet said that the world began as a primeval atom, he called mm -hmm. it, uh, the primeval egg. Well, he, he called it the primeval atom, which I read in 1950. Yeah. But I, uh, uh, I heard George Gamow actually suggest when he spoke at that time. Yeah, that George Gamow, of course, um, predicted the existence of the microwave background radiation. Mm -hmm. um, so there were many people involved. Indeed, I didn't have time to go into it, but Hubble himself resisted the idea of an expanding universe for quite some time. But theorists had been thinking about it before. It's hard to give credit to absolutely everyone in a short talk like this, mm -hmm. but absolutely, the theoretical ideas were there in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, thanks. I'll take the apple. You'll take the apple, yeah? You sure? There you go. You're hungry. <laughs> yes, uh, I thought I saw some more hands up. Yes, from Will in the back there. Okay. You see, I learned your name. I learned the names of a few of my students in my 800 student classroom. And then I choose them. I call on them by name. And then every student thinks that I know his or her name. <laughs> but in fact, it's a selection bias. I only choose those students whose name I know. And all the other students simply assume that I know their names. Anyway, what's your question? Spoken about? like a true scientist. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, earlier you mentioned that it would have been expected that the universe would be slowing down in its expansion. Um, and uh, that, in fact, is, we find out it's not. Um, and forgetting, to simplify it for a second, and forgetting dark energy for a moment, yes. um, I was wondering if, as these galaxies that are supposed to be pulling on each other um, get further apart, whether that force would become weaker on each other, and whether that might play into it at all. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, forgetting about the dark energy, gravity, of course, is in, yeah, I don't have an app, that's okay, I'll do that, no, 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 go ahead. I have a bottle. I want to show, though no, this That's generalizes dangerous. gravity. This generalizes the idea. I won't toss it very high. Um, you see, it works not just for apples, but for bottles of water. It's a law of universal gravitation, okay? So it's an inverse square law. So as galaxies get farther apart from each other, the pull of gravity weakens. And indeed, the rate of slowing down itself slows down. So if you you look, initially, the bottle is slowing down quite quickly, and then it slows down more slowly, and then it reaches some zero speed, actually, technically, when it turns around. Um, so this is why we expected the universe to be, to be slowing down with time, but, but ever more slowly with time, okay? Now bring in the dark energy. If this is a property of space, then the greater the amount of space between two galaxies, the greater is the repulsive effect, okay? So the repulsion actually increases with time, the attraction decreases. So, in fact, a clear prediction that we made early on was that if this is the cosmological constant or something very much like it, and if we look farther back in time than just four or five billion light years, which is the distance that of the supernovae that we had studied back in 1998, we should see that the universe early on was slowing down. And indeed, we made measurements of supernovae farther away, five, six, seven, eight, nine billion years into the past. And we found that for the first nine billion years, the expansion of the universe was slowing down. And then about five billion years ago, it started speeding up. 
So in the first nine billion years, two things were happening. First, galaxies were close together, so their gravitational attraction was stronger than it is now. Secondly, the amount of dark energy total between them was less than it is now. So deceleration dominated, but as the universe spread apart, gravity, in a sense, was declining in importance for any two galaxies. The uh, repulsion was increasing in importance, and about five billion years ago, the, the curves crossed. The, in a sense, if you go back to this pi, the dark energy, the, in a sense, the, the, where did the laser pointer go? Uh, here it is. The, the slices in the pie change with time. The dark energy is actually becoming more and more important with time overall. And the dark matter is becoming less and less important. But long ago, these parts were the dominant parts, okay? And so five billion years ago, the dark energy was roughly 50%, and so it started dominating. Yeah, but that's a prediction we made, and, and in fact, it was, it was verified through more observations. Yes, um, I thought I saw some hands up. Don't be shy. Uh, yes, right there. Yeah, go ahead, right, right here in the second row. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're waiting for the, um, for the microphone. You'll oh. have to excuse this layman's uh, That's question. That's <laughs> okay, this is very abstract stuff. Um, no, I was just but going But I figured to ask... this is, you know, this is Boazichi University, and so it's not just, you know, some any old place, you know, so I can give you the, the real stuff thank here. Thank you, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> um, and thank you for the talk. The question is, in addition to the telescopes, uh, yes. what kind of advances do you foresee in the methods you will use to look at the universe? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. are there techniques coming up that show you further back in time? Yeah, so, so the techniques that have, we've used, uh, telescopes have gotten better, detectors have gotten better, and computers have become much, much better. So now we can analyze gigantic amounts of data, and we can do computer simulations of billions of particles. We can study, for example, how galaxies merge together. Uh, so computer advances have been fantastic. Uh, in the future, what I foresee uh, are several things. First, computers are going to become even better. Moore's law is still in effect. Um, you know, we're getting more and more computing power every 18 months. It's roughly doubling. But we're also developing new techniques with which to observe the universe. For example, we should, within the next five years, I would say, 10 years at most, detect gravitational waves. Those are actually ripples or, or uh, distortions in the shape of space and time when, for example, stars or black holes come together and merge. Every object, in Einstein's view, distorts the shape of space and time around it. And indeed, you can think of Earth's orbit around the sun as being its natural path within a curved space, okay? Well, if you have two black holes which don't emit light, you might say there's no way we'll ever be able to see them. But if they merge together, they're causing these ripples that are going out because each little indentation in space around the black hole is interacting with the neighboring one and this sends out ripples. If you put your hand in, in a pond of water and do this kind of thing, you can see the waves going out. It's a similar sort of thing. So um, gravitational wave detectors are being uh, developed right now and I think we're within five years of actually detecting gravitational waves. And this will be a completely new way of studying the universe because it's not a form of electromagnetic radiation. It is not light of any kind. Um, you know, so that'll be a, a fantastic thing, just as one example. Yes, question back there. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll, we hope that there will be better and better telescopes, like we're looking forward to the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to the Hubble Telescope. Yes. Another layman's question. No uh, problem. Maybe. That's totally, why I'm here. Yeah, maybe. I'm not here for the physicists. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe totally meaningless, though. Um, throughout your talk, you assume only one universe, right? I mean, is there any chance that there are actually more than one universe yeah. and universes? And would this? And I guess people are talking about this possibility. Yeah, yeah. Serious physicists are now seriously considering the possibility of there being multiple universes in what we now call a multiverse. It's a very attractive idea. And you know, we don't know how our universe came to be, but 
various ideas of how it might have come to be through quantum fluctuations or there's a process known as inflation where it becomes really, really big and little parts of the universe can keep on inflating while other parts do not. And they, you know, in a sense, bud off to become other universes. In fact, a very famous uh, physicist at Stanford, Andre Linde, uh, is, um, has developed the theories of these multiple universes. It's a very attractive idea. I personally am very much in favor of it. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that we are only one of many universes. The trouble is that although this idea comes from scientific reasoning and based on what we think we know, the conclusion that there are multiple universes by its very nature at least temporarily removes itself from being squarely within the realm of science. Because in science we have very clear rules a hypothesis has to be testable in order to be a scientific hypothesis. And the idea of multiple universes in general right now, we don't know of a way of testing. Only when universes collide would we be able to see the effects of that. We would see the imprint of the collision in this, the afterglow of the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation. But in many models, the, the universes don't collide. So how do you demonstrate their presence? Right? So it's sort of science, right? It's not like we just get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom and we say, gee, wouldn't it be great if there were multiple universes? The reasoning is a little bit more scientific than that. Nevertheless, the conclusion right now, we don't know of a way of testing. And so it's not squarely within the realm of science anymore. But it's an interesting thing to consider. Yes. Uh, I thought I saw another hand in the back there. Yes, right there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, does the string theory suggest a possible answer for this dark energy problem? Yeah, so string theory is one of these theories that is um, attempting to unify quantum physics and, uh, and general relativity. The idea being that every particle is a little package of energy called a string or a membrane and different vibrational modes are different particles. So this might be an electron and this might be the up quark and you know, that kind of a thing. Um, string theories predict a vacuum energy but they don't tell you what that vacuum energy necessarily is. The expansion of the universe may well be due to a vacuum energy. This is essentially what the cosmological constant is. And string theorists used to say that there's only one way in which the universe could be built and they're gonna figure out the only possible way that you would get a self-consistent set of laws, of mathematical laws of physics, okay? In the past 10 years, string theory has gone through a radical transformation. They now say that there might be a landscape of 10 to the 500 power different kinds of universes where you have these multi-dimensional spaces, maybe 11 dimensions, 10 of space, one of time, and the way in which they develop, how many big dimensions there are, how many small ones, what's the shape of the small ones, that, they think, can occur in many, many different ways. And so, if that's the case, then our universe is one of just a gigantic number. Indeed, the string theorists are among the main proponents now of the multiverse idea. And it could be that the vacuum energy is just an arbitrary number. Um, it's something that could be just about anything. But if it were much, much bigger, then stars and galaxies would not form, so we would not be here. But an answer of zero out of all the numbers it could be is very unlikely. So they would say that it's not surprising that we live in a universe with a small but non-zero cosmological constant. If that is the case, then it may well be that um, the dark energy points generically to a class of string theories, but the specific value of the dark energy will not allow us to distinguish between different variations. Maybe, maybe not. We just don't know. 
Um, but it's funny that you ask, because in 1998 or 1999, I gave a presentation on our discovery. And there was a very famous string theorist in the audience. And he raised his hand and he asked a question. Really, it was a statement. He said, there's no way that you guys, you observational astronomers, can possibly be right about this accelerating expansion. And I said, well, why not? He said, because no theory right now explains it. And I said, well, that's OK. You know, there's plenty of time. You'll think up things. He says, no, no, there's no possible explanation for this. And so there I took a little bit of a offense. I said, well, you know, um, I'm an observational astronomer. I only know which end of the telescope to look through, OK? We and others will continue to test this, this result. You know, every result needs to be verified in more than one way in science. And indeed, the more important the result, the more important it is to have independent verifications. And I just didn't have time to tell you about all the methods now. Um, so I said, if we're wrong, I hope we're wrong for a subtle reason. Not some computer programming error gave 2 plus 2 equals 5. That would be embarrassing, OK? But if we're wrong for some subtle reason, like uh, maybe the supernovae long ago were not exactly the same power as they are right now, OK? Or maybe there's fog in the way, making them look dimmer. So we had to rule out all these things. But maybe we didn't completely rule them out. So if not, that would teach us something interesting. But if we're right, I told him, I'm sure that clever theoretical physicists will find not one, but many ways to explain our result. And indeed, just in string theory, there are now 10 to the 500 power possible vacuum energies. And in non-string theory, there are other ideas uh, known generically as quintessence, sort of like the Aristotelian fifth essence, you know, earth, air, fire, and water, and the quintessence out there. They postulate uh, not a vacuum energy due to quantum fluctuations, but rather a new type of a field. They're called scalar fields. A scalar field is just a temperature, for example, at every point of this room can be thought of as a scalar field. It's just a, a quantity that describes every point. Um, OK. So they think there might be some new kind of a field that has this repulsive effect. It's sort of like the Higgs. The Higgs was a, is a field, and now the Higgs particle seems to have been found, you know. And the historical precedent to this is this idea of inflation of Alan Guth and Andre Linde. They said that when the universe was just a tiny fraction of a second old, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, it grew, whoosh, it exponentially expanded to an, essentially an arbitrarily large size from something as small as you want. It was driven by something like today's dark energy. Now, the, they call it the inflaton, which caused inflation. But it was essentially a, like a dark energy, <clears throat> except more powerful than what we have now. Uh, and right now, we have just the beginnings of acceleration. We do not yet have exponentiation, OK, because the dark energy is still not completely 99.99% dominant. But when it becomes that way, we will be exponentiating, OK? But inflation did not last forever. It stopped. So it could not have been the cosmological constant. It had to have been something different, um, one, you know, a new type of field, the inflaton, the, a, a some kind of a you know, substance which it inflated the universe for a while, and then it decayed into more or less normal stuff, us, matter, and antimatter, and photons. And the matter and antimatter annihilated, and for some reason that we don't quite yet understand, there was an excess of matter over an antimatter, and blah, blah, blah. And so we exist, okay? So there's an example, there's a historical precedent to something like the dark energy, which lasted for a while, but not forever, okay? So we don't know whether today's dark energy will last forever or really is the vacuum energy suggested by various classes of string theory. And so what people like myself are trying to do is more accurately measure the expansion history of the universe because depending on how much it was slowing down originally and depending on how its behavior has been in the past few billion years, we can rule out certain types of theories because 
they make predictions that are inconsistent with observations. For example, we can already rule out that uh, the dark energy is in the form of what's called cosmic strings or domain walls, two types of peculiar structures predicted by certain types of string theories. Okay? We can already rule those out because they predict a, a history of the expansion that differs from what we have measured so far. So that was a long answer, but it was a particularly good question. All the questions were good, actually. Other questions, maybe up from the, from the top level there. No? Oh, yes, right there. Okay. Again, coming from a layman. Uh, okay, that's lay okay. Woman, yeah. Lay woman. Uh, is there any way uh, that it's possible that the process of expansion could be reversed? Yeah. So could the process of expansion be reversed? Certainly without the dark energy, that's a possibility, because if the density of the universe exceeds a certain critical value, then you can calculate that in a sense, the universe isn't expanding at a speed greater than the escape speed, right? It's, uh, it's like if the Earth's mass were bigger, it would take a greater energy, a greater speed to get this, ball, this uh, apple or ball or, um, or water bottle to escape, okay? So, you know, for, for a long time, astronomers were interested in whether the universe is or is not dense enough to cause this recollapse, okay? All right, well, we now know that in terms of just matter, anything that attracts, at least currently, it's clearly not dense enough. It's only 30% of the required density. The required density to make it stop would be this whole pi, by the way, okay? So it's only 30%. That suggests that, you know, you throw the universe and it expands forever. On top of that, there's this dark energy, which is causing not just, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's accelerating the expansion. So if all this remains this way, you know, attractive dark and normal matter, repulsive dark energy, then the universe will not recollapse. But if the dark energy someday becomes gravitationally attractive, then it could reverse, possibly. And again, the historical precedent is inflation. Inflation was exponentially expanding the universe to begin with, but then it decayed into normal stuff that's gravitationally attractive. So the universe started decelerating. After this accelerating phase that lasted a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, it started decelerating. It was, in, it was just, you know, in this motion dominated by gravity because the, the dark energy of long ago turned into normal gravitationally attractive stuff. Okay, so suppose the dark energy does the same thing then the universe will start decelerating. Then the question is whether there's enough of it to ever completely halt the expansion. There, I'm afraid, the answer is we don't know. And I don't know that we will ever know because it turns out that the overall density of the universe is extremely close to the dividing line between a universe that can ultimately recollapse if the stuff becomes gravitationally attractive and one that will expand forever even if the stuff becomes gravitationally attractive. We're right on that dividing line and we don't know which side of the dividing line we're on. And moreover, we are so close to the dividing line and if measurements keep on showing that we're closer and closer and closer, then it could be that we will never know for the following reason. There can be variations within this much, much bigger universe than what we just see. By the way, inflation predicts this much, much bigger universe. And observationally, we can already tell that the universe is bigger than what we can see. There are ways we can tell that. Anyway, here's the point. This room has a certain number of molecules per cubic centimeter on average, right? It's just some number. But any particular cubic centimeter that you measure is very unlikely to be right at that average. There's a distribution of densities. Two-thirds of all the cubic centimeters are within one standard deviation in this Bell curve. You know, 95% of them are within two standard deviations. Very few of them are right at the average. That's a very unlikely thing. So suppose you measure a particular cubic centimeter. You measure the density, and you're very close to the average. You don't know 
without having measured the whole room, which side of that average you're on, right? You don't know. So in a similar way, we can only measure the one visible universe in which we're located. That's one of these cubic centimeters in the analogy of the room. How do we know what the whole universe's density is when there can be these variations? This is called cosmic variance. There's just statistical variations in the amount of stuff in each unit volume. And if you're very close to the average in any given unit volume, you actually don't know what the overall volume's properties are. So I have come to the conclusion, not just me, this is my conclusion, that um, unless we measure the universe to be either a little bit too dense or not dense enough, to a precision that's very, very high, so let me give you an answer, let me give you a value. Um, the, 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 the interesting number is one, for reasons I won't go into. We know that we're 1.00, plus or minus point, no, we know that we're 1.005, I think it is, for the latest measurements, plus or minus 0.005. Well, that's consistent with one, okay? So you don't know what you are. If we next measure 1.001, plus or minus 0.001, well, that's consistent with one as well. Or maybe we'll measure 1.00001 plus or minus 0.01 or something like that. Then, you know, we could be on either side. However, if we someday measure that the number is 1.005 plus or minus 0.000001, well, that's a number that differs by a huge number of standard deviations from, from 1, Okay. And if we, if we believe the measurement, and you measure 1.005, and the uncertainty is 0.0000001, well, then that really looks like it's inconsistent with one, or with a number less than one. Okay? Less than one would be the universe that expands forever. Greater than one is the universe that could eventually recollapse if this stuff becomes gravitationally attractive. But I think probably the universe is at 1.0000, okay? And we'll keep on homing in on that number and the uncertainty in our measurement will always be bigger than the value by which we appear to deviate from one, in which case we won't really know whether we're below one or above one. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah? okay. It's a bit of a hard concept to, uh, to explain. These are great questions, by the way. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll repeat the, oh, okay, here, here comes the microphone. It'll give me a chance to get a drink of water. <laughs> so if we assume that the, uh, there are other universes and multiverses like true, yeah. uh, can this repulsive force of dark energy actually be the uh, not repul uh, impulsive force of gravitation between universes? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting idea. If there are multiple universes, could this acceleration actually be caused by the presence of these other universes? There are some theorists working on that possibility. It appears not to be um, all that likely, or at least it's not a favorite idea among the theorists, but there are some people working on it. There are also some theorists working on the idea that dark matter excuse me, is actually a concentration of matter in dimensions that we can't see. And so there's a bunch of matter in some other dimension, but we can't see it. But the gravitational influence is felt, maybe. So, you know, this, this actually has something to do with these string theories again. In string theory, gravitons, which are the carriers of gravity, are little loops of string, little loops of energy. And unlike light, which are open strings, light has the property where these strings are attached to the x, y, z dimensions of this room. So we only see light traveling through, through this room. But gravitons, if they're loops, can actually leave the x, y, z space in which we live, and they can go off into some other dimension. That's the theory, at least. 
So this might explain, first of all, why gravity is so weak. You might not think that gravity is weak because it's the dominant force that we feel, but it turns out in terms of the fundamental parameters, gravity is actually quite weak. And it's quite a mystery as to why it's that weak. It might be that weak because it mostly exists in some other dimension, which is called the bulk. We're like a membrane, a brain, a membrane inside the bulk. So if gravity is mostly in the bulk, then maybe that explains why measured gravity in our three dimensions is so weak. It might also explain why there's this dark matter. Maybe that's concentrations of matter elsewhere. That particular idea, again, is not a favorite idea among the theorists, but it is being considered by some people. So great question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, well, thank you very much for your... Uh... <laughs>